afternoon. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to talk about democratizing AI. So I was asked to start with uh, my personal journey. So I thought I'd start the, at the beginning. I was born in London, and I did my elementary school in London. And then I moved to Nigeria and did uh, middle school and high school. And then I did undergraduate and graduate school at Michigan. So in the first 20 years of my life, I lived on three continents. And that gave me broad exposure to people, different people, culture, and ideas, and made the idea of trying new things, expanding into new areas, uh, seem kind of natural, and gave me a kind of pioneering spirit. But I didn't actually do any actual pioneering work until I uh, became a uh, Stanford professor. Uh, and I, uh, you know, whenever you're uh, kind of pioneering in the academic world, it's all about doing things before it becomes the popular thing to do, and sometimes you're doing things that people think are a bad idea. That was certainly the case for the work that we did in the multi-core processor space uh, before it was popular, and people, most people were working on single processors and making them faster, and we said that eventually you're going to run out of steam on a single processor, and you need to think about how you scale, put multiple processors on a chip and how to do that effect efficiently. And we did that, and we showed that it was a good idea, and we founded a company based on that. It was called Afara. It got acquired by a, another company called Sun Microsystems. And then I went back to the university and started thinking about how to develop software to make multi-core microprocessors more useful. So we came up with the idea of domain-specific languages, uh, which was an idea that, of course, people are using all the time to do machine learning. A and we showed that early, we showed early prototypes of what you could do with uh, domain-specific languages and, and AI before AI blew up, right? So, you know, in, in the early 2000s, we showed that you could apply multi-core ideas to uh, uh, AI and get much better, much higher performance and uh, much more efficient processing. And that leads to the work that we're doing today about new ways of uh, developing hardware and software that will make uh, AI technology much more accessible. And we're doing that with a couple of startups uh, called Sambanova and Migo. So as examples of how technology uh, can change, uh, the, the, the become democratized, can change human history, uh, we have the printing press. So the invention of the printing press, of course, changed uh, the, uh, the way that knowledge was disseminated because you were able to use mechanical movable type, movable type to generate uh, books much more, more efficiently and much more cheaply, and you took it out of the uh, realm of, of the high priests. The same thing occurred for time and longitude. Uh, to provide safe ocean navigation, you need to understand, you need to be able to, to, to uh, uh, figure out both latitude and longitude. Uh, but before the, the uh, advent of uh, the chronometer and the sextant, it wasn't a, you weren't able to, to uh, effectively uh, calculate uh, longitude. And so what happened was that only the Venetians who uh, controlled the trade around the, the Mediterranean were, were able to, to uh, uh, determine world trade. However, once you had time and longitude, now you could navigate the oceans and you could open up uh, trade across a much wider area. And the last example is the automotive industry, which Henry Ford revolutionized with the assembly line, faster production, cheaper production, and uh, the, uh, which made uh, cars and automobiles much more available, much more widely available. And so you think about printing press, right? Well, this is all about you know, creating a, a, you know, a freedom, democratization of, of, of knowledge and creating a freedom of ideas. Time and longitude, uh, democratization was un unleashing of markets, making trade more accessible. And the automotive uh, uh, dem dem democratization allowed movement of people and cheaper automobiles. Now, AI, of course, has the potential for much greater societal impact than any of these technologies. And the key thing is making the uh, elements of, of AI accessible to a much wider set of people uh, than traditionally has been the case. So AI, of course, is ripe for democratization uh, because there are lots of uses for AI, and we've already heard ab about some of them already, but you can think of any uh, area of society, health, education, uh, transportation, communication, 
they all are, will, will be disrupted by AI, so there's lots of potential demand, but of course we need to make sure that as AI gets used, it gets used and, and developed, and, and the models get developed by a diverse range of people so that we don't get the bias situation that we have uh, currently in, in some, of these, uh, 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 some of these applications. Now, the supply side is, is what is, is missing to, to uh, uh, create uh, uh, the, democracy, uh, the, the democratization, uh, and, and the tools are starting to, to become available, but they aren't at the level at which uh, that, that makes it accessible uh, to most of the people. So if you look at what the situation is today, uh, you have a situation where, you know, for many tasks, uh, these tasks that were thought to be uh, difficult tasks, such as speech recognition and object uh, recognition, uh, the AI-powered uh, uh, algorithms uh, are able to uh, reach human-level accuracy. Uh, this is just an example showing uh, speech recognition accuracy over time. And uh, however, if you look at the uh, people who are able to develop, or, or the, uh, develop these uh, sorts of systems, they're in the hands of the few. Uh, the large companies that have both the data, the computation, uh, and the talent to develop uh, these sorts of algorithms. And of course, they've used uh, this capability uh, to develop them, uh, develop, uh, these companies have used this, this, uh, these systems to become the most valuable companies in the world, Google, Amazon, at Facebook, at Apple, and the like. And so the question is, how do we enable more people to have access uh, to these sorts of technologies? Well, if you look at the key uh, ways that, that these companies have been able to develop these uh, applications, it's by you taking massive amounts of data and building more and more complex models that uh, have higher accuracy. And the way that you, en you enable this, of course, is with more powerful compute. And so what has to happen to make these technologies more accessible and more available is that we need a revolution and disruption in both the hardware that powers AI and the software that uh, develops the algorithms. So what does this disruption look like in the hardware? Let's first look at the hardware. So, uh, so if you look at, at, uh, at, at, at the process of developing these AI or machine learning models, right? So uh, uh, most of AI, of course, is actually machine, machine learning. The AI, as uh, Greg said, is the PowerPoint uh, version. Uh, it, you see that the, the training is done by you know, specialized ASICs like TPUs or more general accelerators like GPUs, and that inference uh, which has to happen with very low latency as the request comes in. You want to evaluate the model. So training is building the model, and inference is evaluating the model, and that's typically done with, with, with low power ASICs or CPUs. And what we <coughs> believe is that inference and training have to be merged, and the reason that you want to do this is because you want to be able to use much less complex, smaller models and the only way for that to work is to be able to train these models continuously, right? And so if you need to train continuously, then you need to have the ability to do both inference and training on the same sort of hardware. Uh, the other benefit that you get by doing this is that you get to fine tune your model uh, to take advantage of the environment in which you are trying to make predictions. So how do you come up with a platform that provides the capabilities for both inference and training, given the challenges of the uh, environment that we currently face our, uh, see ourselves in, right? So uh, Moore's law, of course, which has powered the semiconductor and the, the, the uh, computer industry for the last uh, 50 years, is basically slowing down, right? It may be not quite dead yet, but it's on its last legs, right, in terms of the improvements that we have seen uh, over the years. Uh, however, more importantly, there's this other thing called Denard scaling, which says the power efficiencies you get from uh, you know, future uh, process improvements have basically ended, right? So now we're power constrained, and that means everything has to be done more efficiently. So if you look at the current uh, landscape 
of, uh, of, of computation. Uh, on the uh, x-axis, you see flexibility, which is sort of how easy it is to develop uh, software for your uh, particular uh, piece of hardware. And on the y-axis, you see performance, right? And so what you see is that CPUs, of course, are the most flexible uh, 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 computing device, but they also are the uh, least performant. And then uh, GPUs, of course, provide more uh, performance but less flexibility. And then specialized ASICs, especially ASICs that are focused on a particular machine learning algorithm like dense matrix multiply, which of course, there's a lot of things you can do with dense matrix multiply, but it won't do everything. Uh, like the TPU, they get much higher performance, but of course, they're not very flexible. So what we need to do is we want to break out off of this curve uh, defined by traditional architectures and provide a new paradigm for doing hardware compute that we call reconfigurable data flow. And reconfigurable data flow is a ground up reimagining of how to do compute based on having to, based on focusing on what machine learning algorithms need, right? And so if you look at uh, what reconfigurable data flow is, it is a sea of computation and memory closely coupled together by a programmable uh, network. And the key to that programmable network is you can program the data flow between the different compute and memory elements in a way that matches the needs of the, uh, the application that you're trying to run. So as an example, uh, here is a image processing, uh, image recognition, object recognition uh, pipeline. Uh, you know, from a, uh, a neural network uh, benchmark called AlexNet, just a piece of it. And you see, you know, multiple components which are connected together uh, by, uh, by the, the, the data that flows between them, right? So you've got convolution, followed by pooling, followed by batch norm. And the way that you would map that to a reconfigurable data flow architecture would be to map the different kernels onto the, the compute and memory units and the data flow would be uh, provided by the underlying connectivity between these units, and it would completely match the flow of data from the, that you would see in the neural network would be matched uh, on the chip. And so what you would get is very efficient data flow communication and very efficient use of the uh, utilization of the compute and memory, which would lead to very high performance and very uh, uh, high uh, efficiency. Uh, the other benefit, of course, is, of co is if the algorithm change, you just reconfigure to match the data flows in your new algorithm. So the other part of the disruption, right, so you've got, we, we just disrupted hardware with this new paradigm for compu computation called reconfigurable data flow. The other piece uh, is, is the software. Right? And the software is also changing, and it's changing uh, in, in, a, in it's, it's what we call software 2.0. Right? And so if you think about conventional software development that we're calling software 1.0, it's focused on algorithms, and it's focused on instruction flow. Right? So you have a problem, you find some domain expert who uh, knows about that area, and they write a lot of C code, right? And it requires uh, you to decompose the problem based on your domain knowledge and then solve, uh, come up with algorithms for, for each of these different pieces and then compose those algorithms into a system. Contrast that with software 2.0, which is data focused and data flow focused, where the developer curates the data, comes up with training data, and there are new ways of, of, of coming up with training data that don't require you to come up with individual examples uh, for each of the, the tra elements of your training data set. Uh, and, but the point is, it's all about the data, and the data is used to train models, and the training process is an optimization process that gives you a network, right? And then the network then can be used to solve your problem. And so what you find is that it's often much easier to apply the software 2.0 approach compared to the conventional approach in that it's cheaper and easier to come up with a model 
uh, that, that you train based on data than it is to go the conventional route of developing algorithms and composing them together. The uh, example uh, shown here is, is Google Translation, right? So Google shrunk their uh, language translation from 500,000 lines of code, uh, which was conventional C code, to 500 lines of data flow. So it's data flow, and of course, as I said, you want a data flow, if you've got a data flow problem, you want a data flow computer to solve that problem, and that's what you get with reconfigurable data flow. Uh, so, and it's not just for the high-end problems of language translation, you know, image recognition, that, that this software 2.0 approach works. It also works for classical problems. Turns out that many classical problems from data cleaning to networking to databases have a bunch of heuristics in them. And you know, the algorithms, much of the problems can't be solved you know, without heuristics because they're sort of MP hard. And so what you find is you're better off replacing those heuristics with models based on data because you both get higher accuracy, better, be, better uh, performance. Uh, you get the better, your, your software performs better uh, in terms of the goal that you're trying to achieve, but also uh, the software works better and it, you know, has, has more predictable memory behavior. And uh, all, all, all around, it's easier to deploy these sorts of solutions. So it turns out that reconfigurable data flow architecture and software 2.0 form this virtuous cycle, right? So reconfigurable data flow architecture is going to give you efficiency in terms of executing uh, the, these sorts of applications, and it's also going to enable you to do things that you couldn't do before if you were running uh, these applications on conventional hardware. So it unlocks a whole new uh, uh, genre of, of uh, applications uh, by, by, by having this efficiency, and it enables you uh, to, uh, uh, to, to create, it, it creates a platform that can be used for developing a whole new set of, uh, of, of applications that are based on, on AI. And software 2.0 then, of course, is, as I said, the, the application development is uh, a data flow. It, 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 you, you typically develop these applications using these high-level frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow, which were, of course, uh, developed in Python. And, you know, in fact, as I said, come out of some of the ideas that we developed uh, about 10 years ago about using these specific domain-specific languages uh, to develop machine learning applications. And once you've got data flow, then, as I said, the best way to execute data flow is with a reconfigurable data flow architecture. And uh, so as an example of sort of how you might use this technology, this is a collaboration with uh, uh, a colleague of mine at Stanford, uh, a guy named Vijay Pandey, who's a professor of bioengineering. And uh, he uh, is also... Uh, famous for doing a uh, distributed computing project called Folding at Home. So he's very interested in, in how proteins fold, uh, folding from, from, from left to right here. Turns out, you know, I have, don't know much about uh, biology. I'll have to ask Greg for, for, for you know, uh, some primers on this. Uh, but apparently, uh, proteins don't, don't just fold one way. There are multiple trajectories uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, proteins uh, take to fold. And it turns out you can analyze these trajectories uh, with a type of uh, machine learning model called a Markov state model. And so it turns out that Pandey's group decided to write some code uh, to analyze uh, these Markov state models, and they wrote it in Python. But it was far too slow. So they got a, a CS undergrad uh, to, uh, you know, to code up the Python and make it much faster. So that CS undergrad said, I know how to do that. I'm going to write it in C++, which is a much lower level language than Python, and I'm going to throw in a little x86 assembly language for good measure so that I can get much more performance. And they sped up that Python by 1,500 times. And then, of course, they got hired by Facebook or Google or so on, <laughs> and, and, and they left the group, and, and then, you know, Vijay's uh, uh, your group of, of biologists didn't know what to do with the code. And so we came along, we said, you know, what you want is a domain-specific language that allows you to express things at much higher level, and not only can you get the performance that you get, uh, you know, better, you can get better performance on, on the C, 
uh, sorts of implementations, but you could, can speed things up by another factor of three or four by using domain-specific languages. And then this is even before we get to the da reconfigurable data flow architecture approach uh, that I just described. So what is the impact of this? The impact is to enable uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, other 99% of, of people to use uh, AI technology and to uh, create applications uh, that are more widely applicable uh, to more of the world. So if you think about what Sam Bonova is doing, we are in fact developing this reconfigurable data flow architecture and uh, technology around software 2.0. So both the hardware and software that is required for this AI democratization and then there's a comp another company I'm involved in called Migo, which is using this technology uh, to make uh, AI technology accessible to the wider world. So Migo is focused on the two billion uh, mobile users in emerging markets without uh, credit histories and some of them without even bank accounts. And what it is is a platform for consumer enterprises to offer cash loans and point of sale credit and the way that we're able to do that is by aggregating data across all of these consumer uh, uh, enterprise partners to build AI models that can be used to underwrite the loan. So you didn't have to consult a FICO store. You could build a model that would uh, tell you whether someone was a good uh, uh, risk or not. And so it turns out the majority of, of the borrowers are small merchants, uh, you know, delivering last mile re retail. So it's having a... A, 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 a really is having a direct impact uh, to uh, these sorts of retailers in both Nigeria and uh, also in Brazil. So with that, uh, thank you.